can't. Come on, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, they can't start till I get there. You've got okay. a gray hat on. What? Oh, I got a gray chat on me. Thank you. Yeah. Jeez, uh -huh. <laughs> what are you talking about? Three, two, one. Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 758. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today, September 7th, 2022. All right, welcome to another recording of Anglican Unscripted. We're glad you could join us. This is where Kevin and George sit down in front of our webcams and talk about all things Anglican, Christian, and whatever else out there in the world we want to talk about because that's what this show's all about. <laughs> our opinion on odd topics around the world. There's lots of news this week. Before we get started, please hit the subscribe button. A little icon pops up for a bell. You click that and you will be instantly notified anytime there is a new episode of Anglican Unscripted. Also, we have a podcast format. If you don't want to sit here and look at our morning faces before we've had coffee, you want to definitely sign up and subscribe for the podcast. You go to the show notes on YouTube. There's a link at the bottom, and you can listen, not watch. Good for you. George, how are you doing this week? I am doing great. It's been a hectic time. Uh, Kevin and I usually film on Tuesdays and Fridays, and Tuesdays, we were just so wiped out, we did a show about four or five times. And then Kevin at the end said, as the director, this is not going into the can. We're going to do it again, so let's do it tomorrow. It was pitiful. We were just, hi, how are you? I'm good. We were so and, tired. And this morning, I, we got here bright and early, and I'm thinking, uh-oh. And I'm driving up because there's a Spectrum truck at the base of our hill. And sure enough, uh, no internet. So I go ask the guy, and he says, oh, 20 minutes. And it's an hour and 20 minutes later, but we're now up. So <laughs> and, and you we're going to have a great show, because oh, yeah. I've got the Satan is trying to make sure we don't go on the air this week. Well, and that your, your church schedule, because you have a service in 40 minutes, and I have to have you at that service, and we're not going to... In, in, Unscripted cannot interfere with your, your husband duties, your father duties, or your church duties. So let's get this on the road. Um, going on here to the list, Foley, Archbishop Foley Beach has penned a letter to Justin Welby explaining the new provincial uh, diocese that's going to uh, be formed in Australia. And it's an interesting letter because, first of all, it's open, uh, so that we can all read what he says. And it's interesting because he says, you need to understand, Justin Welby, and I think you do, but you may not. We're not the schismatics here. We're not the one who caused the problem. As Archbishop, or as Bishop Ackerman used to say, we're not the one who started the fire. Mm -hmm. So um, let's talk a little about this letter, George. Foley Beach penned a letter about the Diocese of the Southern Cross. Mm -hmm. It came on, uh, the letter was printed on GAFCON stationery, and he's writing in his capacity as chairman of the GAFCON Primates Council. And this is the first public post Lambeth. Uh, exchange of letters we've seen and we now know we're in a new world because Foley Beach is not as deferential as he's been in the past and I th Justin Welby at Lambeth famously said he's no longer going to exercise leadership well Foley is and the mm -hmm. GAFCOM primates are exercising leadership Justin may play his own game but no GAFCON is not going to be playing on uh, Justin's field mm -hmm. two points that Foley wanted to make he wanted to say first, this is being done out of pastoral necessity. This is not just to be difficult or schismatic. Setting up a non-geographic diocese to serve Anglicans in those parts of Australia where the diocese have gone around the bend. And second, Kevin, as you said, Foley writes, some may unfairly slander us as schismatics, but you know that in reality it is those who depart from the established teaching of the church who are causing the division. So Foley is basically laying out quite clearly, this is what's happening in Australia. We didn't choose for this course, but we have to take this course. And he's also telegraphing to, Foley, to Justin Welby, I believe, that if England goes round the bend with living in love and faith, the uh, pressure will be increased uh, in England for those 
who wish to have alternative Episcopal oversight or a new province. And if they're going to do it in Australia, they can do it in England, too. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and that's, we'll t- report on that in, in a, our last story. But we're getting down here to the nitty gritty. What is church for? And mm-hmm. church, you know, as far as I can read, like from Acts, uh, the purpose of church is to gather around and uh, continue the apostles' teachings, the breaking of the bread, uh, reaching out to the uh, widows and orphans. It's not here to succumb to the uh, zeitgeist of the day. It's Kevin, here you're to, abs- it's here to be a, a deference to it. You're absolutely right. I mean, the GAFCON Global South concept of church is fundamentally different from Justin Welby's. Justin Welby believes the Great Commission is go out and preserve an institution. For the GAFCON primates and for the Global South primates, it's go out and make disciples. And however that works, as so long as we're winning souls for Christ, that is what we're called to do. We are not called to empower the church as an institution. Institutions serve an end, which is bringing the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. And if that institution is not fit for purpose, we go with another way. Uh, this is heresy for Justin Welby, who worships the institution. Absolutely. Yeah. And Jesus Christ seems to be pretty far away behind. Um, but there you are. It's, it, 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 it's, it's very black and white. It is. Unity at all costs, uh, despite the gospel, is certainly what we're seeing from the Church of England. All right, so let's move on here and talk about our next topic. It's, it, this is an interesting story because uh, it deals with a person our age who was recently consecrated like six uh, um, this summer, and he died six days after consecration. And if you look at him, you look at a Kevin George, a little overweight, hard overworked. (laughs) (laughs) (coughs) We we, we should talk about this in many different ways, George. But what's the story here? George Geppetto is the newly consecrated bishop of Mwapwa. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful MWA, PWA. It's a diocese in southern Tanzania. Uh, He was consecrated a week ago, Friday or Saturday. Mm -hmm. And... One of the bishops at, who, from Tanzania who attended Lambeth and his wife, with his wife, they went on vacation after Lambeth, and she died suddenly while they were in Norway. The body was brought back to Tanzania, and last uh, Friday, the funeral was held, and all the bishops who were able to come came. Well, the bishop who was tagged to preach the funeral sermon was late, and in Africa, you know, travel is not always runs like clockwork. And so the bishops asked the newest member of the College of Bishops in Tanzania if he would preach, because he had a noted reputation as a preacher. He was a professor at Saint at the Tanzanian Anglican College, I think it's St. John's University, before he became bishop. And he got up, preached a stem winder of a sermon, really voluble, excited, you know, just a real faith, powerful sermon. And he sat down, mentioned to the person sitting next to him, the bishop sitting next to him, they didn't feel too well. And he dropped out of a heart attack. Uh, the citizen newspaper of Dar es Salaam reported that he suffered from diabetes, check. High blood pressure, check. He was a little overweight from the picture, check. He was 59 years old, check. check. And uh, he just, and it was hot in church and he gave a great sermon, check, 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 check. So, uh, Kevin, <laughs> you and I need to be quite, cl- quite, quite clear about what we need to do and not to do in our right. health these days. Yeah, I, preach no widow's sermons for bishops. I think is what it's telling me. Oh, indeed. So it, it's certainly a sad story, but you know it's interesting because uh, of its relationship to uh, George and I by age. Uh, on to our next story here, um, and I just wrote this down uh, out of jest, but the AINE. A-N-I-E has not announced the names of the new bishops that they announced were going to be coming soon, George. And I'm kind of wondering if you knew anything about that. Well, about a month and a half ago, the Anglican Network in Europe announced that they were going to have two more bishops. Uh, the Anglican Mission in England announced they were going to have two more suffragans, and they named them. Mm-hmm. The Anglican Network in England, I hope I have the nem- nomenclature correct, uh, said yes we're going to have two bishops too there'll be four new bishops Mm -hmm. and here we are five six weeks out 
I may be exaggerating, but it feels like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. We still don't have any names. And I'm thinking, okay, why, why is this? What's going on that, uh, and the answer is, I have no clue what's oh, going yeah. on. And in other words, and, and this, and because I have no clue, this causes a speculation arises. Did they do the background checks and the people didn't pass? Did Sydney put down a no, 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 and they had to do it over again? Did the people whom they wanted say no, thank you? Um, Possibly. Or, or did they just say, yeah, we'll have two bishops, but we hadn't thought who the two will be? Um, uh -huh. It's another awkward misstep. Yeah. Another awkward misstep. Well, they're, they're new to the block. You know, the new kids on the block here. Uh, but yeah, you need to be really good with your press releases and follow-ups. Uh, as a journalist, I'll tell you what, uh, you make and break your organization by being able to follow up to your stories. And we would appreciate a follow-up out there. All right, on to our next story. We're going to talk about Bernard Randall, who is a chaplain. I'm sorry, former chaplain at Trent College. He was fired for giving a sermon that clearly outlined the canons of the Church of England and scripture on the teaching of sexuality. And uh, if I got fired for uh, preaching the gospel and I had a bishop, I would expect that bishop to protect me and come to my defense. But this story has got very convoluted. It involves safeguarding involves the press, involves people being fired and not rehired, and now this guy's reputation has been trashed. George, let's give a little background first about uh, uh, Bernard. Okay, I'm, and I'm even going to go farther back than that. Uh -oh. About a year, year or two ago, when Gavin Ashenden was still on the with us in the show, well, we were talking about the new emphasis on safeguarding the Church of England had introduced. Mm -hmm. After all these scandals that have touched the Archbishop of Canberra, the Archbishop of York, of not uh, doing proper reporting, this and that. They were really going to be serious about safeguarding. And one of the comments Gavin made at the time was that, just you wait, this will be used, weaponized against traditionalists. This will be another way that the uh, institution quiets noisy clergy and perverts safeguarding from being a way to root out the perverts in the clergy ranks to you a weapon to squash dissent okay we'll move forward 2019 uh, dr bernard randall chaplain at uh, trent college which is a private boarding school uh in england outside of nottingham uh gives a sermon on human sexuality and he t says to the young boys and girls question authority don't just buy all this woke nonsense you know you need to understand here's what the bible says and here's what culture is saying but just don't buy into the cultural narrative there are some eternal truths so it was not some fred phelps god hates fags sermon don't. it was a sophisticated intellectual but Chris deeply christian sermon well, the headmaster at Trent College, who was a, a liberal, uh, woke, woke, extremely wokeist, <laughs> wokester, <laughs> suspended him for this sermon because it was hurtful and offensive to the gay and lesbian and whatnot community. Sec and this led to his eventually being fired for preaching a Christian sermon in, in a Christian school. It's a Church of England uh, school. It's not an atheist school or anything like that, or secular. And this was a, uh, an, uh, I would say, minor news issue where it's another victim of the woke uh, movement. Well, he filed a complaint with an employment tribunal and it came, and, it, and the tribunal hearing is this week. Well, on Sunday, this past Sunday, the Sun Mail on Sunday, one of the big major newspapers, ran a story saying that not only is this man uh, challenging his dismissal on woke grounds, but he went to his bishop in the Diocese of Derby, spelled D-E-R-V-Y, Derby, Derby. And it's his bishop, Libby Lane, who's not a character from Superman, but is the actual bishop of Derby. 
and he looked for support. In other words, here he's preaching the official stance doctrine of the Church of England, and he's in trouble for it, and he thought the Church of England would sort of back him up. Well, the diocese did a safeguarding review, and the safeguarding review found that for having taught traditional official church doctrine, he, he was a moderate risk to children and they would not license him anymore, and they didn't want him to work with children because, well, what if a transgendered nine-year-old or 12-year-old came to him and he told them the truth of Jesus Christ, God made them male and female, he created them, that would cause the child anxiety. And so the safeguarding officer in the Diocese of Derby has now said that the Church of England's official doctrine on human sexuality causes safeguarding risks to children. And Bishop Lane has dropped him like a hot potato. I don't want anything to do with this guy. I'm not going to help him. I'm not going to defend him. I'm not going to stand up for the church's official teaching. Well, when this story broke in the Daily Mail, oh, this caused the, the commentator class in England in the religious media to just blow up on Libby Lane. Now, she has the unfortunate reputation of not being not too bright not too able she well, is the first woman yeah, bishop. she was the first the first bishop so first woman token. bishop token and she really is showing her tokenism by being inoffensive and not really you know causing much consternation other way one way or the other mm -hmm. and we've had uh, clergy in her diocese tell her that uh, she is in many ways like joe biden she's brain dead and the archdeacons and the various uh ministry heads run the show and we're seeing evidence of this where the safeguarding department is now seeing fit to define what doctrine is so a second or third tier bureaucrat is now stating what salvation where salvation arises not the bishop not any historical sense but you know the salvation the deep, the, Salvation now comes from the surgeon who can transform your body to male to female or female to male to the psychologist who can convince you to take uh, hormone therapy, hormone blockers, so that you will feel natural in your, your body. That's where salvation lies, George. And I think that's the salvation that Libby Lane, certainly the Church of England and all those who did not speak out against this atrocity uh, believe there's a new and, salvation in town it comes and with kevin, a scalpel and you're exactly right kevin about speaking out nobody of any position in the hierarchy is speaking out in support of bernard randall mm -hmm. uh, his career has been ruined he is unable to work with young people anymore if, if this safeguarding thing remains on his record and no bishop has so far had the courage to stand up and say, this is wrong, this is what we believe, and you cannot penalize somebody for teaching what the church's official stance is. And instead, the deep state within the Church of England and runs the show, and the bishops are just, now I've called them gray non-entities who are rather unimpressive as a group. Well. How can you not how can you disagree with me at this point if none of them are willing to stand up for the faith yeah. what is the point of the church of england's house of bishops at this stage that they will not speak something they're not asked to be courageous they're not asked to be uh you know doing anything well, that is actually if if you're a bishop there is something you're being asked to do and you can find that in titus uh, a bishop must hold firmly to the trustworthy message as it has been taught, so that he has encouraged others by sound doctrine and refute those who oppose the sound doctrine. I don't see any Church of England bishop, European bishop, most Anglican bishops that are refuting unsound doctrine. Well, it's, it's just in well be... Uh it didn't start with Justin Welby, but it reached its climax with Justin Welby of bishops are essentially regional managers of Woolworths. The uh, head office sends down the directive and they just carry it out. They're not asked to exercise any of the traditional 
uh, not now. This is, of course, not a bl- this is a blanket statement which will be wrong. <laughs> there are excellent bishops, mm-hmm. and I and I have no doubt about that, and I will not argue that point. But the culture of the House of Bishops is one that rewards mediocrity. Um, what I now Bernard Randall uh, can lay a cl- clergy disciplinary measure complaint against Libby Lane on the grounds that uh, unequal treatment. If he were a gay man propagating a liberal progressive view of human sexuality, first off, none of this would have happened. Mm -hmm. Second, the bishops would be all over supporting him. We saw this uh, in the Diocese of London where a young black uh, gay curate made a a national noise uh, by uh, insulting Captain Tom, I forget his last name, he was very well known. The World War II guy, yeah. World War, and well, of course, those people are protected. Mm-hmm. Now, it doesn't help that Calvin Robinson is a good is friends with uh, uh, Bernard Randall. Uh, that that puts him on the yes. SHIT list for the Church of England. <laughs> but the uh, the corruption of the institution. Um, you know all the old jokes of that when why do why do you lay hands on a bishop when it becomes a bishop what's to remove the spine they pull it out and that's all that all those dumb jokes not so dumb anymore no not so dumb anymore no. and that and this is not a controversial issue this is not a, a question of uh you know exploring new territories this is good old-fashioned non-disputable standard church of england doctrine and the bishops will not stand for it. No, what is the point of being a bit of the House of Bishops at this stage? Um, what is the point of Libby Lane? I no, I, I don't want to show well, my here, frustration. Here's, you know, here's another another thing that no Church of England bishop has been subjected to discipline under the clergy disciplinary measure. In other words, it's fixed because complaints are brought, you know, again and again and again against Stephen Croft, against, you know, for, uh, usually over cover up allegations and human sexuality. The only time they nail anybody is if they're retired. Uh, you know, George Carey. Um, the one exception was the Bishop of Lincoln, whom Justin Welby decided to make a uh, virtue signal uh, sacrifice to. Um, who was recently suspended uh, for things that Justin Welby has actually done worse things. But of course, the Bishop of Lincoln was basically a non-entity and he was disp- he was dis- uh, expendable. And so we can make a PR point. So dead bishops, uh, retired bi- archbishops, um, unpopular bishops can be disciplined but if you're Libby Lane, the first woman bishop, and you're part of the collective, if you will, the Church of England's Borg, for a Star Trek reference. It's a very good reference. You 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 can get away with murder, or you can get away with not doing anything, not doing your job, just collecting your pay and appearing at a parish to smile with pictures of kids uh, every Sunday. The ironic thing here is his sermon started with question authority. The, the mantra of the 1960s, 70s academia. And there used to be a time where you could question authority. We've now reached the time where you're not allowed here in America or in the West to question authority. Imagine a journalist right now putting together a really good paper questioning the election for Trump. Could it get published anywhere? No, no. <laughs> there's, there's, this, there's hot topic issues now that will not get published anywhere because we have gone beyond the point where we can question authority. Authority has firmly established it refuses to be questioned. Libby Lane will not face any questioning in this whatsoever. She may look bad in the press for a couple days, but she'll move on. Uh, this won't reach the office of Justin Welby in any way, shape, or form. He has survived far worse than this little embarrassment. He'll move on and, and do just fine because nobody's allowed to question them. Well, well we do, but we're, we're a small-time show. But we have to live in this reality now where we can't question authority. The, and 
it's not just the Church of England, it's, it's our whole system. Mm -hmm. The only person disciplined in the United States military over the Afghanistan fiasco was a Marine Lieutenant Colonel who mouthed off about the incompetence of the generals at the top. None of the generals at the top who basically facilitated the Taliban's takeover Afghanistan, they couldn't have done a better job of it, mm -hmm. have in any way suffered for their gross incompetence. Uh, has anybody in the Federal Reserve or in the Treasury Department suffered because of the absolute fiasco they've made of the economy in the United States? You know, we're going to have a, either a massive depression or a massive crash or, well, there are plenty of YouTube shows that you can watch to tell you about that. But there's, there's no, uh, there are no consequences for incompetence anymore. No. And we see it in the Church of England. We see it in the Episcopal Church. Um, now, the there's system, no consequences. The system of the church, as described uh, certainly by Western Anglicanism, is, is clearly broken. How they describe church and how they operate church is clearly unbiblical and clearly teaches unbiblical ways. And mm -hmm. it's, it's hard to watch because now they're no different than the United Nations, they're, except the United Nations actually cares. <laughs> you know, so... You know, one of those things, George, let's move on to our next news story. Uh, I don't have anything on the list. You wanted to talk about a couple more things, though. Yeah. Uh, the Episcopal Church hasn't figured out yet that the Me Too movement has passed its peak uh, prime. There's a uh, diocese of Southern Ohio is in a transition. Its bishop has retired. And they have a provisional bishop, George Wayne Smith, the bishop of former bishop of Missouri. The Episcopal Church makes sure that there's jobs for the boys. Mm -hmm. um, these retired bishops, these get, get these well-paid sinecures and get to uh, continue to inflict damage on the church. Well, the uh, priest in charge of St. Paul's in Oakwood, Ohio, which is a suburb or section of Dayton. He's going through a divorce with his wife, and it's turning out to be nasty and messy. Some divorces can be very messy. They make the press, and they try to level a playing field. doesn't work. And one of the, the, the wife of Daniel McLean, the priest at St. Paul's Oakwood, went to Bishop Smith and accused her husband of domestic violence. Bishop Smith adopted that women never lie about these things and immediately suspended McLean and began an institute began proceedings to it's in essence remove him from the ministry. Well, in its total shockeroo, the tribunal or the commission that looked into this found that it looks like the wife is making this up to get back at her husband. There's no evidence. There's nothing at all about this. The parish where he's serving, the vestry, is voted to ask him to come back. Um, and But Bishop Smith finally had to say, well, I guess the commission did find him not guilty, but we're still going to look into this further until... Uh, he realizes that uh, bishops are not allowed to make bishops don't make mistakes and if he's not guilty of this we'll find him guilty of something else yeah so this poor guy has had again like bernard randall he's had his career ruined by what appears to be a false accusation during a messy divorce case i don't know the details of the divorce and i don't want to know but the point is here we've got a bishop who without doing any due diligence or looking into this or even talking to the priest ahead of time decides that women never lie in divorce proceedings well, that might be news to divorce lawyers i'm but, sure uh, somewhere in the episcopal church there's a place you can go back to get your reputation we had that in the mm, reagan era no you don't think no, no i don't think you can get well in some respects, this has sort of made this priest even more valued by his congregation because they know the man and they know the wife and they have said, we want him back. Yeah. So I, that says something. 
uh let's let me say if, if theoretically if i my wife well not theoretically my wife is more popular than i am in the parish and if we fell apart you can better you better <laughs> believe nine out of ten people would be on my wife's side in that Absolutely. fight yep all right so you know in as such i am assuming that diocese had a line item list of things to do when a clergy person is accused and I'm assuming they didn't follow the list again. Well, we do. They do, but it's the mindset which is guilty and proven innocent. Mm -hmm. uh, the, one of the things we talked about with you know the clergy disciplinary measure in the Church of England, talking about Bernard Randall and others that we've mentioned over the past, doesn't work. It's easily manipulated, and it favors the institution. In recent years, the Title IV proceedings in the Episcopal Church have been rejiggered to, in essence, uh, make sure the institution always wins. It's mm -hmm. the dealer will always win every hand in the in the casino of the Episcopal Church now. And we here, here's an example of it where a bishop can um, basically destroy a man unthinkingly, um, and there are no consequences to the bishop. And this guy basically has to. Spend, next, spend the re remainder of his ministry overcoming suspicions that there really might be something there because bishops don't make mistakes. All right, next story. It's a small world. We're both from Florida. We both had to sit on that small world ride at Disney at one point or another in our life. But we reported last week on the, the Haitian gun running, drug running, gun smuggling operation uh, within the Episcopal Church. And I use that word on purpose. And you found out that there's a small, small world story that involves you. I keep a very firm wall between my writing, Anglican Inc., mm -hmm. Anglican Unscripted, and my parish. I would say nine out of ten people don't really know that that's something I do. It's a firewall. Um, Good thinking. Yeah. And so I got an email the other day from my former senior warden. She says, oh, George, please pray for the dear friend of mine named Franz. Franz is a priest in Haiti. Now, she's a, a um, sister of this, the working society of wor mission working, one of these religious orders, but she's a lay uh, affiliate. Mm -hmm. She said, years ago, this orphan, we basically rescued, educated him. He became an Episcopal priest. He runs a church and a school, and we support him, and he's a wonderful man. I've known him all of his adult life. He's just been arrested for smuggling guns. And I said, oh, my goodness, Mary, I wrote a story about this guy, and it doesn't look good. Evidently, uh, well, in a snap customs inspection in Haiti, which is probably the most snap thing that will ever happen in Haiti, I mean... How many of these things? Well, a container labeled relief supplies destined for the Diocese of Haiti was inspected. And inside, instead of dried milk and blankets and pencils, they found uh, we automatic weapons and ammunitions and counterfeit currency. Mm -hmm. Basically, all the paraphernalia for the drug gangs down there. And the diocesan accountant was arrested and found since 2017 he has been authorizing these shipments, which appear to be gun running stuff. And one of the one of the consignees is his father Franz. And my friend said, "It is I can't a man can't be guilty." And he, you know he. You know, in Haiti, the justice system, you know, when you go to prison, you usually die in prison before the trial because of cholera or typhus or whatever. And and I have no knowledge or truth other than what I've uh, about the truth of this matter. But it's just, you know, it's such a small world. Yeah. Who would have thought that, well, you know. But here's the most important thing she said in her letter. Pray. Mm -hmm. We do need to pray for these individuals. Everyone we talk about here is not short of a response to the gospel is not mm -hmm. short of coming back to a loving relationship with the transforming love of jesus christ none of them every situation here is redeemable and can cause glory much glory to the kingdom 
So I, I do want to end with that. Uh, we're coming up on 10 o'clock. Y- you're already in your cleric, so you don't have to, uh, to rush too hard to get to the other room. But I want to be sure that you understand the importance here of what we're speaking, and that's to pray for these individuals. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 758 of Anglican Unscripted.